And I think that's the point my mindset changed from beating someone to achieving the best that I can do. How's it going, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 592, with my guest today, Kazuki Hongo. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, show host and Whistlekick founder, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, go to whistlekick.com. That's the place to learn about all of our projects and our products. And you can even find a place to buy the stuff that we make over there. And the code, don't forget this, PODCAST15 gets you 15% off anything that we sell. Now, everything for this show is on a different website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you this show twice a week. And our goal here at Whistlekick, well, we're working hard to connect, educate, and entertain you, the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to help the show and support the work that we do, you can do a number of things. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media. You could tell a friend about us or pick up a book on Amazon, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or wherever, or you could support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick is the place to go for that. You can support us monthly with as little as $2 a month. And we've got options going up for there. Bottom line, the more you're willing to throw our way, the more exclusive content you're going to get access to. It's exclusively for Patreon supporters. And we've done stuff recently, like I did a, a bonus video slash audio episode talking about exploring skills that maybe you're not so good at and the impact of that on your overall martial arts training. On today's episode, I had the pleasure of talking with Kazuki Hongo, who has the distinction of being a martial artist coming from a martial arts style that I'm all but sure. I did a quick check and I don't, I don't see anybody. So my apologies if I'm wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. Here we are. It's episode 592 and we're still bringing on people with martial arts practices that haven't been on before. How cool is that? That's how diverse, deep martial arts traditions are throughout the world. And I love that. It's one of my favorite things about what we do. In this episode, we talk about how he got started, how it impacted his personality, what he's done since he's retired, and the demands of being a national champion. Talk about that and a whole bunch more. So here we go with the episode. Hongo-san, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks for doing this. This will be fun. You, uh, you're going to talk about something that you've done that I'm, I'm going to guess. Okay. Almost nobody, maybe one or two people listening to this, unless they're friends or, or people who've trained with you, have done. You're, you're, you're going you're gonna to talk about something that you've trained in that most of us haven't trained in, and I'm super pumped for that. And listeners are, are, are wondering, what's, what's he talking about? What's Jeremy talking about? We'll get there. We'll get there. And, but I'd rather just kind of let it, let it happen. So let's start with this. Okay. What's your earliest memory of any martial art at all, being aware of what martial arts was? Was it a, was it a movie or a TV show or something like that? Well, I think it was... Um... I first saw karate when I lived in the U.S. My friends were practicing karate. So I think that was the first time I, I've seen uh, martial arts, if that's answering the question. And do you, do you remember the context? Hey, would, um, did you go v hang out with somebody and they were you know, training karate and so you went to watch them do class? Or? Well, I remember um, going to a friend's party, a birthday party. And um, we had to wear those um, dogi, the the uniforms, and um, we get we had a chance to chop woods. I don't know how how, how to express it, but uh, yeah, that that works. Yeah, the, I, I have like a memory that I was going to a friend's birthday party and wearing <laughs> uniforms and chopping the woods with my bare hands. And that was how really old, fun. How old were you? I think I was eight or like seven years old. 
maybe I'm spoiling this a little bit, but at, at some point, not long after, you know, a few years later, you moved out of the U.S. So were you, were you born in the U.S. or did you move here when you were young? Um, I moved to the U.S. when I was young. Well, I was born in Japan, but uh, because of my father's work, I moved to a few countries, which were Hong Kong, Korea, the United States, and Hong Kong, uh, no, and Singapore. So four countries. And then I came back to Japan when I was 12 years old. And from that day, I'm living in Tokyo since then. Is your father in finance, banking? No, he was oh. he was working in um, at a uh, zipper company. Oh, OK. Yeah. Those are all countries that I that I know of as being uh, heavy yeah. with banks, you know, financial institutions. The friends that I met when I lived in overseas, their fathers were all working at financial companies. So, <laughs> yeah, but my father wasn't working in financial company. He was he was a he was a businessman at uh, at a zipper company. I think everyone knows. So seven, eight years old, you're at this birthday party. It's the first time you put on a gi. You break some boards, and. What did you think? Was this something you said, oh, this is super cool? Or, hey, this is kind of fun. I'm going to go, you know, eat cake now. What was your takeaway? Well, at the moment, what I remember was that it was my hands were hurt because <laughs> I was I was chopping wood. So, yeah, I didn't I didn't think that karate was the kind of sport that I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. Was there any other martial arts experience prior to your return to Tokyo? I started playing Kido, Japanese archery, when I started junior high school, middle school. Okay. Yeah, that, that was the first time I seen Kido. And I never known there was a martial arts called Kido. And, well, if I talk about my life, I, I was, well, like um, in Japan... The entrance exams, if I'm saying it right, if I'm ex expressing it right, um, it, it's uh, a lot of kids take the entrance exam mm -hmm. when they're when they're graduating elementary school to go into a really good middle school. And since I was studying really, really a long time, I, I was studying like the whole day. And I became fat, and I I wasn't in a I wasn't in a shape that I could run or play sports. So when I entered middle school, I wanted to start a sport where I didn't have to run, and also where everyone is in the same start line. Mm. So their experience until 12 years old doesn't matter i wanted to do some kind of sport like that and that's when i found kido where everyone most most of the people even in japan they don't they start around middle school or maybe high school so like 12 years old uh, 13 years old or 30 uh, 16 years old and so the experience doesn't matter and they didn't run so that was like the my true thought of the reason why I started Kudo. But um, when I asked my parents, what did I say in those days? Um, they, they told me that I, I told them that I wanted to play Kudo because I wanted, I, I lived in overseas for a long time. And I didn't know the Japanese, like the typical Japanese culture. And I wanted to become Japanese. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's why I wanted to play. I wanted to join the Kudo team, the Kudo club. Okay. Do you, do you believe that answer now? Or do you think you were well, fibbing to your parents? It's, it sounds like you're not quite sure if that was the real reason then. Well, you know, there are, um, yeah, there are, I think both the reasons are true. 
and that I did think that I was, I, I felt a bit um, outside um, from the students around me mm-hmm. since like, um, it's going to be like a PR, but like Japan is a really good country and it's very convenient. There's a lot of convenience stores and it, it's clean and it's cheap and a lot of it felt really new to me but for the people around me it um it was like it's ordinary for them so a lot of like besides those points i felt really outside and not feeling japanese so um the reason i told uh, the reason that i uh I told my parents, I think that is true. If I'm answering the question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're doing you're doing fine. When I ask a question, there's no requirement that you answer it. I just ask the question to keep talking. Okay. <laughs> okay. We have plenty of episodes where I'll ask a question and 20 minutes later the guest will pause and say, Did I answer your question? And I say, I don't even remember the question. Just keep going. <laughs> okay. I'm, well, I'm wondering well, yeah. about. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh uh, well, yeah. Um, that that was the start of my kudo okay. life. Okay. But why why kudo? If, if I'm imagining, I'm I'm trying to put myself in your in your place, and I would imagine that if I came back to Japan, and I'm trying to honor and and embrace my culture, mm-hmm. my heritage. I would think I would choose something that was um, more common. Mm. I I would if you if you asked me if if we had if you had told that story up until the point where you chose Kyoto if we had put a pause in the story there and you said guess what I chose I would have guessed karate. Mm. Did you not choose karate because of your experience when you were younger, or was it was there something else there? Um, it was totally different. It was something else. And um, well, first of all, uh, kudo is not common in Japan too, but actually, the numbers of people practicing especially in high school is the most i think i think mm. it was okay. so like judo and karate and um many other martial arts that are common overseas are quite different in japan well especially in high school i think well if you research it i think it's going to come up but when i recently searched about the population of uh, people uh, the population of the people practicing kudo um it said that the the high school when you when you put in high school um kudo is the most common in the martial arts mm-hmm. so when i the reason why i chose kudo was because there was a lot of members in the club in our school compared to the other martial arts club so there was uh, there was judo and there was karate and there was kendo like the the sword mm-hmm. one, the martial arts of the japanese swords and compared to the other martial clubs the uh, martial arts club the kudo club was the most common in our school oh. and uh, they, they had a very good reputation they were winning a lot and they were strong so I, that's why I chose Kudo. Do you remember your first day of Kudo? Yes. What was, well, what was that like? I, I think everybody listening knows that, that feeling of your first day of training and how anxious you can be, but excited and everything is new. You don't know, you don't know anything. Every single thing that they show you and tell you is brand new. What was that like for you? It was really, really boring. <laughs> That's not the answer I expected. Boring. How was it boring? Um, well, kudo 
is um, to the audiences that doesn't know Kudo, um, to explain what kind of sport it is, is a, um, we, um, we uh, compete by shooting arrows. Sure. And the length of the, from where you're standing and to the uh, target is 28 meters. And I think it's right. I, th I think it was 28 meters. And um, the, the wide of the target is 36 centimeters. Okay. And it, it's, it's pretty dangerous because if you shoot an arrow at someone, of course it's going to hurt them. Sure. So before we start standing on like in front of the target, we have to like know the rules and the uh, kata. Like it, there, it's called the um, shaho hasetsu, and it's a Japanese word. And um, it's called the uh, how do you say it in English? But it's like the eight um, style to shoot an arrow. And you have to first do it in air, like playing bear guitar. Mm -hmm. And then you will be able to use this practice bow, which is made out of um, rubber. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be able to stand in front of this this practice um, target, if you, it's called makiwara, but if you translate it in English, it's going to be rolled straw. So there's mm -hmm. this big pile of straw where you can shoot at it and it's not dangerous. So we use it before um, sending. It's going to be like a warm up when you become. Um, when you become a player, but before you even start as a player, you have to like step, like take by step by step. So in my first day of the practice, I wasn't able to touch the bow or touch the arrows or even wear the uniform, but <laughs> we just had to like do this air thing and I remember it was really, really boring. And it was boring until I, I think I, it was boring until like the third day, uh, the third month, because it's, third month. it takes a lot. Yeah, it wow. takes a lot of time to be able to like, to the school to give us the bow to practice. So I remember it was really boring and I wanted to quit the club on my third day or something. But but you didn't. Why not? Um I think it was my teammates, especially my teammates. Um it was really fun playing with and like not playing as in practicing kudo, but playing games and talking. And it was fun. So I think that's the reason why um, I didn't quit. I remember that time of my life. And yeah, just about everything that we do or want to do has to do with what our friends are doing. And it's something that I'm hoping martial arts schools, uh, instructors, school owners that are listening to this, hear this, that the social mm -hmm. component here was enough to keep you going even though you were bored for months uh -huh. because there were friends there. Yeah. And also, um, in addition to that, in addition to, um, my teammates being really fun to play with, um, there was this guy, my team, he was an elder, um, senpai, if you say in Japanese, uh, 
and he was really um he was a bit harsh and he he was really like to be honest he was really irritating <laughs> and those like bad not bad but those thoughts and feelings motivated me to not quit and become better than him so well th- that that feeling um keep motivating me for a long time even um through my uh college years um but that that was a big part of me that didn't make me quit the club was this senpai was this uh another student in the school or was this someone older uh, he was older uh he, he was um in the school he was one one year older than me okay and since in japan um there's this there's this culture where the elder you are the like they they have to be um I don't know how to say it, but uh, the 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 older you are, the better, and their position in the club. It doesn't matter if they are good or not, but the youngers have to admire them. And um, because of that, he he was really well. He was my teammate. Uh, he was my longest teammate throughout my ten years of kudo. practice and he was a very good rival to me but um i remember that when i joined the club and on the second day or something i think he said that um you're not going to be able to play kudo or whatever and i was really like motivated to beat him <laughs> one day and that kept me on going. I get that. I I can I can relate to that motivation. I've had mm-hmm. people like that in my life and I think most of us have that just their existence their uh frustration their criticism what whatever it is is motivating for us to get better. So if if you continue to play and he remained a rival that suggests to me that you got a lot better and yes. maybe at some point you started beating him at least yes, some of the I time yes i did yes what was it like the first time you beat him it was well um the first time i beat him was when i was in second grade and it was like thrilling but i i didn't win the tournament i won i beat him but i wasn't the first hmm. and that made me more motivated so i wasn't like fulfilled with my achievement like not just beating him and i think that's the point when i like my mind set changed from beating someone to like achieving the best that I, I can do okay so well, to um to sum it up i wasn't like the typical like not typical but i wasn't like the person or player that wanted to practice to do for my like my mental thoughts or something but it was all about winning and um getting better um to not get in beaten by anyone so that was my that was my motivation were you competitive outside of kudo uh what about academics um To be honest, no. I was not <laughs> good okay. at taking tests. Well, throughout my 10 years, 
Well, I started Kudo when I was 13, and I retired last year when I graduated um, university. And I used all of my time, like really um, all of my time to getting better. So when I was, well, this is not good. But it's not a good, I'm not a good student, but when I was taking classes, I would put my iPhone inside my, uh, my uh, like the case, my pen case, like where, where I put my pen and all those stuff for school. I would put my iPhone inside there and I would watch my videos throughout the lesson and i would know on like what kind of practice i need to do today and yeah so when i um think about my high school life and mid school life it was all about getting better at kudo so mm. my you were I all could, in yeah i was all in all of my all in yes that, that's yeah. the perfectly see it so i didn't i, I didn't have teacher, a lot of friends you didn't I, have a lot of friends okay no um well well i the first time i won the national um it was when i was in uh my last year in high school and it was and after that um a lot of japanese students where um, they don't have to take entrance exams for universities or colleges. Um, they go out to take a vacation and play with your friends. But when I retired from high school Kyudo, I noticed that I didn't have a lot of friends because I used all of my time and resources on getting better at Kyudo. So yeah, yeah, that that's a, like, a very big memory to me that noticed me myself that I use all of my time all in to Kyudo. What did your parents think of that? What did your, your teachers think of that? This, this singular focus on Kyudo? Well, um, although I didn't have like great score like a good score i did like do like the at least line like the minimum line <laughs> for the school so my parents did say to study more and think about my career but after a few years when i when when they recognized not recognized but they when they understood that i was not like lying on lying that i wanted to be the best player um they didn't like they, they started motivated me and they took my back and they supported me and the teachers were the same as well well, I didn't do good, but as I said, um, I did the minimum line. I, I did not to um, drop lessons or drop grades. So they, they didn't say that I was like not a good student. After I think it was like the third year, the middle school, the th third middle school year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until from then they, well, like that's like the point when I started to um, win at tournaments and the school recognized me that I was doing well. And from that point, they, they didn't like, yeah, they, they supported me from there. Yeah. Now we've, we've kind of skipped over this progress, you know, in a, in a fairly short period of time, you went from being completely new to mm -hmm. this art to being very very good at this art mm -hmm. how did you get so good was it because you were all in 
and watching videos during class and really committed to it in a way that others were not? Or was there more to it? Well, um, it was, I think there are mainly two reasons that I became so well. And the first reason was the environment of my club. There were really good coaches and they taught me a lot of things. And well, um, I graduated a school called KO and they have like a culture where the elders, um, uh, the elders try to teach the youngers as in like, they have like a culture. I don't know how to say it, but um, there, there's this environment and uh, it's, it, it has like a history of more than 120 years. So um, a lot of the coaches are, were the um, graduates of the school and around like, Around my um, the other schools, they only had one teacher, like the teacher in the school. But we had coaches, a lot of coaches. Like they, I think there were like six or seven. And most of the other schools, they only had one teacher and one coach, which means one coach. And um, our coaches, they had the experience a lot more than most of the other teachers in other schools. So the coaches taught me um, a lot of things and they knew the highest level of Kyudo. And I think that was the first reason, like the biggest, I think it's the biggest reason. I, I think it was their help that made me a good player. And the second reason was my um, uh, my personality or like character, where I'm motivated the most when I'm like rejected by someone. If I'm saying it right, but yeah, when someone says you can't achieve it, I become more motivated and more encouraged to like to keep me up and well i remember when i was in um when i was in high school my school changed class every year like the, the um the classmates changed every year and there was this classmate and um, we had to introduce ourselves introduce ourselves on the first day of school and when i was introducing myself i said that my um my dream is to become the best player in kudo and he said well i think he was joking I, well he was joking but he was saying that you can't do that you're not going to be able to achieve that and that made my heart like really motivated mm -hmm. and that words kept me um, pushing myself. Sure. So those like my personality and the coaches and the environment was the two reasons I think the most that I was able to become a good player. I get it. And I can relate to that. I'm very similar when someone tells me you can't do something. I work that much harder on it. In fact, what we do here at Whistlekick, yeah. everybody at the beginning said, you can't do that. It's not going to work. Don't bother. Just quit now. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think man, we, can, I mean, we can tell them where, where they can go with that opinion. Now, here we are years later. Mm -hmm. let's, yeah. let's talk about how your kudo practice impacted 
your life. Because when we talk about martial arts, no matter what the martial art is, no matter what country it comes from, when we talk to people on this show, we hear their stories about how their training made their lives better. Um, As you got mm -hmm. deeper and better into your Kyoto practice, how did it change you? Um, I think it changed in a lot of ways of my life. But, um, well, first of all, I'm working at a company called Mitsubishi Corporation. And um, I think I wouldn't have been able to join this company if I didn't play Kudo. And um, well, the reason why I think is, I, uh, um, the reason I, why is, well, I think there's two big lessons that I learned. And the first was the lesson that um, there are things, oh wait, that's the second one. Well, the first thing is that I learned that it's every responsibility is coming to you. And Kudo is not a sport or a martial art that competes with an opponent, like a living opponent or person. You have to compete with yourself since the target's not moving and the environment, the rule doesn't change and the environment doesn't change even in practice or even in the tournament or in the games. So for other martial arts or any sport, there's always going to be an opponent, most of the sport, like not golf or um, or maybe athletics, like um, running. Um, they are similar, but Kudo doesn't have an opponent. So every single arrow that you shoot, is going to be your responsibility and no one's going to be able to like change positions for you and even if you don't have confidence even if you're not in a good um in a good moment not good moment but um even if you're not like doing well at that point you still have to do your work you have to um, be responsible on what you do. And that's like, I think that's the biggest lesson that I learned from Kudo. And the second one is that there are stuffs or occasions that you can't um uh um you can't uh control mm. sure. and for um the kudo uh tournaments in middle school high school and in college or university it the most common way the most common rule is played by a team so you get to shoot four arrows but they sum up the total number of the arrows that are in the target as a team so even if you'll be able to shoot four arrows in the target and you um, take responsibility of what you have to do. There are certain times where your teammates aren't doing as well as you do, and you lose. 
but I think understanding that was like the second biggest lesson that I learned from Kudo. So you play by an, an individual. You only have to get four arrows and you can't change. But when you see it as a team, you're not, even if you're in a good um, circumstances, you're not able to support any of your other teammates, like changing arrows or um, like instead of your teammates shooting, you can't do that. And I think that's the, like learning that lesson is, was a quite big influence to me throughout my life. So like what, the reason why I thought why um, I learned this lesson, especially the second one was I became like the ace member, like the best team, uh, like the best player in the club around when I was in the first year of high school. And, but, and the coaches depended on me. So they taught me a lot of lessons and taught me their experience. And so my mindset and um, my level was very high compared to my other teammates. So I like, I, I could shoot the target over 90% when I was in the third year of my high school. And that's pretty, that's pretty good. And um, not a lot of people can go to that stage. But I was able to become one of that players to um, shoot the target 90% more. And that, but as a result, throughout my last year in high school, I lost most of the games. I think I didn't, I wasn't able to win as a team in my last year of high school. Although, like, I don't want to say this, but I was like the best player in the my region. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I learned a lesson that there are stuff and occasions that you can't just control. But if you want to, you have to prepare and think about the big picture and like you have to motivate not only yourself but your teammates to achieve your big goal hmm. yeah th th that's the um that's why i, I th that's what i learned from kudo okay now you've mentioned a couple times that you've retired from kudo mm-hmm why um well i am a coach at my high school team right now okay but well there aren't like you can't live with live by playing kudo like you can't be a pro athlete in kudo and you have to work and since i became and i was be, i was able to be in a high level in kudo um i i like knew that i can't like put all my time throughout my life and keep my level after graduating um, university. And like, I don't know how to say, but I, I just, I didn't want 
to become a player that like I, I didn't want to become a player that in a lower level that I was before. Mm, okay. So that's why I'm 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 a coach right now. So you don't have to become you don't have to put your you don't have to all um you have to all in all of your resources. Sure. Yeah. It becomes harder First, as you mm -hmm. step into the world and become an adult and have all these other responsibilities. And I think we see that in a lot of sports that people who stay competitive at a high level, whether it's a martial art or something else, they tend to delay a lot of things. Quite often, they're delaying family or starting a business or a professional career that they really want because their athletics or, or competitive endeavor is so important. Mm -hmm. And I, I completely understand what you're saying, that it was time to put it down, to step away, to not be all in so you could invest some of that energy in other things. Yes. And... um. Well, as I said before, um, like the, I think the biggest reason is is because that I didn't have the confidence to keep up my level, like working and doing both at the best. I didn't have I don't have the confidence still, and I didn't want my level to like I I didn't want my level to get lower. I think that that's the biggest reason that I put down Kyoto. Sure. Sure, I get that. Okay. And also, what? it wasn't really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What changed? Well, my thoughts weren't like... Mm, it wasn't something that I was supposed to have fun with. It was like my job. So, and since my, uh, the um, club that I joined when I was in um, university, uh, it was, they, they had a really long history and you had response. You had a big responsibility to win and not losing, and taking responsibility and um, yeah, it, it wasn't like practicing wasn't fun for me, especially in my last years. Because a lot of my run, the the coaches and the graduates of our club were like pushing me really hard that you have to win this game, you have to win that tournament, and all those you have those responsibilities as a captain, and that I because I was uh, a player that everyone knew it, th there, there was this pressure on me and yeah, it wasn't fun. So I think that's why that that's also why. Um, and if, if I play Kudo again, I, I thought that I would like my, my memories of those years were going to come back to me. And it does, as a coach, it does come back to me right now. But as a player, I couldn't stand that. So, mm. yeah, that that's another reason, too. Is coaching fun? Well, yes, coaching is fun. Because it's not about me. First of all. <laughs> and you can see that. You can see the influence on the students. 
from me that they're doing better. And um, most of the um, most of the students start from 13 or 16 years, 16 years old, and they don't have a lot of experience. So the more you teach them, the more they get better. And when you see them having really big smiles on their face, when they get better, it makes me feel good. So coaching is fun, although I have to use half of my weekends to them. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's fun. It's fun. Good. Good. All right. Do you think you would ever try another martial art? Or would it only ever be Kudo? Um, I do want to play Kendo at some point of my life. Okay. And I want, I do have like a feeling to use my experience um, on other sports um, or martial arts. Mm -hmm and see where I can go and like testing my experience on other sports and martial arts if this is only for Kudo or not. I do have the thought like that, but it's not my time yet. I get it. Okay. This seems like a good point to, to wind down I always ask the guest uh, a pretty similar question. I'm going to ask it in a different way with you mm -hmm. as we as we close up this episode. Usually I ask the guests for just some parting words of wisdom, but I want to do this a little differently. Let's imagine that the audience was a Kudo team that you are coaching and the match is about to begin and you have to give them some advice mm -hmm. and then walk away. The final words that they hear from you before the competition begins, what would you tell them? I would say it's not about the opponent. It's about you. And even it's the final game of the the day, um, this is going to keep on going. And so you've got to focus on yourself and not to be others. I would say that. And I did say that when I was a captain to all of my teammates that it's all about you and just focus on yourself. Do what you have to do and dominate. Yeah, I did say that. I had a great time with that conversation. And, you know, first off, super cool talking to somebody who's trained in Kudo. And if you haven't really dug into what this art is, I would suggest you check it out. We didn't, get into the real depth, the artistry that is this martial art pursuit sport, however you want to term it. We got some hints of it as he was talking about, you know, that, that day one, you're not shooting a bow downrange, that there's a lot there. But if, if you look up, and, and I did this as a result of our conversation, I did a little bit of research and it goes so deep. There's so much intricacy and nuance as you would expect of a traditional martial art. And that's what this is. I really want to thank you for coming on the show, Hango-san. Uh, such a fun conversation. I really enjoyed getting to talk to you, learning something. And I, I, I'm going to speculate for the audience, but I can say for sure, for me, I took a lot away from this. So I appreciate your time and your openness, your willingness to share. If you, the audience, want to go deeper, check out this episode, other stuff that we've got going on at 
Martial Arts Radio, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you're going to find videos and links and photos and social media and a whole bunch more. And it's not just for this episode, but every single episode we have ever made. If you're up for supporting us and the work that we do, you have lots of options. You might consider buying one of our Amazon books, telling others about the show, or supporting us at patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you're looking for the ideal strength and conditioning program for martial artists, I made it, and you can get it at whistlekick.com. Use the code PODCAST15 to get 15% off that program or anything else that we make. If you've got suggestions, guests, general feedback, topics, whatever it is, let us know. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick everywhere you can think of. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 